Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sanzano, host of the Jake and Gino podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best line author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barbo, Gino, how's it going? Jake, I'm doing good. Do you mind if I start out this podcast with two quick quotes? I want everyone to better, write better than opera. We'll take it. I can, I can end it with opera, but let me start out with these two quotes because <laughs> it's really important. This will set the stage for this amazing conversation that we're about to have. Revenue is vanity. Profit margin is sanity. And cash is king. That's what Jake and Gina live by. Profit per door. That's what we're looking for. The cash in the pocket. And big does not equal great, and great does not equal big, Jake. Let me say that once again. Big does not equal great, and great does not equal big. Take it away, Mr. Stenzi. Boom shakalaka. All right, today's guest is editor-at-large of Inc. Magazine and the author of five books, including Small Giants, Companies That Choose to Be Great Instead of Big, and Finish Big, How Great Entrepreneurs Exit Their Companies on Top. So without further ado, Bo Burlingham, welcome to the show. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. We are looking forward to it as well. So I just finished Small Giants, and I really cannot wait to dive into the book with you because I had so many epiphanies. But before I do, please just share with the audience your background and how you got started. Well, uh, how I got started, I mean, I've been around a long time, so I don't think you want to hear the whole story of how I got started. <laughs> but how I got started in business was that I, I was uh, recruited back in the early 1980s. to I was a sort of a freelance journalist, and I was recruited back in the 1980s to go work for a little magazine that had just been started in Boston, which is where I live, called Inc. Magazine. And it was only about it was a startup still, and it was only about four years old. And uh, they were looking for writers who had a, uh, a background in sort of general interest magazine writing, which I did, and who knew something about business. Well, as it happened, I'd been actually working at Fidelity Investments for a year. And uh, I had warned F Fidelity not to hire me because I said I didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond. They said, oh, no, no, we'll t teach you all that. So I, on the basis of my having been at Fidelity for a year, I knew something about business, not very much. And uh, so I got to go to work at Inc. Magazine. And that was really a tremendous experience because you guys are probably too young to remember it. But there was a time when it was not a compliment to call somebody an entrepreneur. It was sort of a put down. It's like you told your parents you were going to, after you, you know, graduated from college, that you were going to, in fact go into business for yourself, they would look at you with great disappointment and say, you mean you're going to throw away your education? Uh, mm -hmm. And that was beginning to change in the early 1980s. And partly, you know, there were a lot of causes for that. Ronald Reagan was one of them. And because he was the first president, at least that I ever heard of, who actually talked about entrepreneurship. I like to think that Inc. Magazine was part of the changing concept of entrepreneurship, but mainly it was changing because of the people who's, who were creating new companies. I mean, Steve Jobs uh, was in the first issue of uh, Inc. Magazine. And, uh, uh, you know, Bill Gates, Microsoft was on our list of the fastest growing private companies. Mm -hmm. uh, not our first list either, our second list. Oracle. I mean, there were all these companies. I mean, Ben and Jerry's, uh, Patagonia, all of these companies that were brand new companies. And the whole idea of the whole image of what entrepreneurs are and what entrepreneurship is, were changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was actually a very exciting time because for a long time, at least for, for most of the 1980s, it felt like we were the only ones who were paying attention to this, that mm -hmm. uh, all the other, the big magazines uh, like uh, Fortune and Forbes and Business Week and so forth, you know, they were looking at competition with Japan or, uh, you know, they, they have articles about what was happening with U.S. Steel and, its, and the United Steel Workers Union. And if you were, uh, had a small company, like a company like yours, for example, um, you know, you look at that and you'd say, well, what does this have to do with me? Mm -hmm. And that was the question that uh, the founder of Inc. Magazine started out with. His name is Bernie Goldhirsch, wonderful guy. And uh, 
he had a magazine. He sort of was one of those people who wound up in business without ever intending to go into business. Mm-hmm. He had a he had a magazine, a, sa- a magazine called Sale, which actually became a very successful magazine. And suddenly he had all of these questions and he didn't have any place to turn to answer them. And so he decided, well, I must not be the only person in this situation. Mm-hmm. I think I'll start a publication that addresses that. And so, the, so he started Inc. Magazine in 1979. And as I say, when I got there in uh, 19, well, it was January of 1983, it was uh, still very much a startup. Can you, and, can you define, Bo, really quick to, for the listeners? How, how do you define entrepreneurship? So for me, an entrepreneur is somebody who makes enough money to pay for their mistakes. That's the simple, easiest way to, for me to do it. How would you define an entrepreneurship? You've seen the last four or five decades, the evolution of an entrepreneur. And sometimes I think you said they get a, more of a positive outlook. Nowadays, they do and they don't because it looks like, like as if capitalism is being looked upon a little negatively nowadays. But what is your definition of an entrepreneur? That's a hard question, Gino. Um, I take a narrow definition. You know, it got to a point where everybody was calling themselves an entrepreneur. You had politicians calling Mm -hmm. themselves entrepreneurs. I mean, the governor of Massachusetts uh, was saying, you know, I'm a really I'm a real entrepreneur here. And uh, frankly, I I didn't buy it then. I don't buy it now. I think that people who are entrepreneurs go into business and start companies that provide, well, I look at, you know, basically what is business? Business is basically a group of people, at least one person and maybe more, uh, usually more, um, who are working together to try and create something that other people are going to want to buy. And they're going to like it so much that they're actually going to pay more for it Mm -hmm. uh, than it costs you to produce it. That's what profit is. It's Mm -hmm. basically the profit is the applause of customers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, entrepreneurs are people who do that with what they think is a new idea. Now, exactly how new it is and whether or not it's new is going to be decided by other people, Um, you know, the customers, whether or not customers think that your idea is in fact something that's so cool that they want to buy it um if it isn't you probably aren't going to be around it very long Mm -hmm. uh but but that's a very long-winded way of answering your questions you know no it's a great answer i love that you know small giants for me, it, it was, gave me a lot of clarity because I didn't want to be the next Facebook. I want to have a small company, an intimate company. I want to have, we wanted to build a company with culture, with core values, a family business. Define to you what a small giant is for the listeners. Small giants are companies that show they've chosen to be great instead of big. And mm-hmm. as you said, starting out, Gino, great does not equal big and big does not equal great. Mm-hmm. Greatness, what is how you define greatness is a separate concept altogether and different people will have different definitions of greatness but the ones that i write about in small giants are companies that have basically chosen not to get as big as possible as fast as possible because they have other goals that they consider more important and those goals have to do with their employees, the relationships with their employees, they have to do with uh, their customers, they have to do with all the different people with whom they have relationships. It's really all about the relationships and what is the quality of those relationships. And that's what they focus on. And they focus on having great relationships with all the groups of people that they come into contact with. And, uh, you know, that, that includes the communities where they're located. Yeah, I love that. You know, in the book, you out of the 14, I'm going to share with you a couple that I, my, my favorite. One one was Zingerman's because I had yeah. a restaurant years and years ago. I love the fact that they built in systems. They had a deli. They had catering. They had all different areas and aspects. Union Square Cafe, another one that I really resonate with, with food. I think his, his idea of that superior customer service, that ability to walk in there and have an, an experience was amazing. 
The one that I respect the most, though, is Cliff's bar, Gary Erickson. He had 120 million bucks in the table. And he said to his partner, I ain't selling. And she said, I want my money. And 99% of us would say, okay, we have to sell. But a lot of money on the table. He stood yeah. to his yeah. ground and he said, you know what? I believe in this company so much. I don't want to see it go to a, a big company that they're just going to mass produce and it's going to lose you know, that, that specialness of Cliff Bar. Which one was your favorite company in the book and why? I honestly do not have a favorite one. I, I love them all. Anchor and, Brewing was cool too. I, I yeah. like the story of Anchor yeah. Brewing. I thought that was yeah. neat. Yeah. yeah, of course. Now, I, I, if you've read the 10th anniversary edition, You know, the companies that I wrote about originally in the Mm -hmm. first edition, that they had changed. Mm -hmm. There was exits involved too at that point. Yeah. There were exits. There were a couple of companies that came very close to going out of business. There was one company. Well, this was a a great company in Los Angeles called Rhythm and Hughes. And your listeners all know about what they do. I mean, you know, if you ever saw Babe in the City or uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. That was a sad one. Yeah. Yeah. And they produced, you know, The Life of Pi was about somebody on a boat with a lion. Yes. And needless to say, nobody was on a boat and there was certainly no lion or tiger on. So that was all done with computer special effects. And it was just a fantastic story and a fantastic picture. And it won the Academy Award as best picture. The irony is that it won that award 11 days after the company filed for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately, Everybody in the company lost their jobs. And uh, I, I think somebody else came along and, you know, they bought the name and bought some of the concept, but it wasn't the same company. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was a sad story. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, there is a YouTube video, which you should watch. It's called Life After Pi. And it's about what happened following the demise of the company that I wrote about in Small Giants. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll check that out. You know, let me jump in for a second here because I have a very uh, personal attachment to this book. And, and the reason is we had a very similar story and we kind of hit a fork in the road as we were approaching a hundred million in assets. Uh-huh. We, Gino and I, um, you know, we essentially were buying apartments, renovating them and holding on to them. We didn't sell anything. Uh-huh. And then there was a lot of interest from, you know, outside investors. Hey, you can, what, what they call syndication and they uh-huh. come in and raise money. And we weren't doing that. And, you know, I think it was probably 2017, maybe sometime around then 2016, we actually did a syndication. And then we did another one. We did we did three of these. And it was it was interesting because the company started to change at that point. And I started to feel it when we actually took the money, if you will. Uh, uh. And it started the, the business started changing for me on a few fronts. One, I actually noticed that ultimately the long my long term profitability wasn't going to be as good taking the outside capital. Mm-hmm. And then two, the the overall enjoyment of the business wasn't there for me anymore. So that's why the book hit me so hard because we were kind of on this trajectory where we could, okay, let's keep taking money and growing and growing and growing. And there was hurdles there. There was customer service defects associated with it. And there was a general lack of enjoyment and and a gut feeling that I'm probably not doing the best thing that I should be doing for what we ultimately want out of this business. And we ultimately pulled back and that's why the book resonated with me so much because we've been on both paths and we've since downshifted and gone back to a direct ownership model and not gone down that road. So that's why the book really you know, hit me between the eyes. Um, and, and I'm going to say something crazy. It probably makes no sense to you, but I'm going to tell you anyways, because it's the best reference I have for the book. And, and I'll ask you, have you ever seen the, the show Sons of Anarchy? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, you have. This makes it so sweet for me. Okay. So John Teller, okay, wrote the manuscript of the, the life and death of Sam Crow. Okay. It's part of it's part of the show and he's his son finds it after his dad dies and he's and it's basically this manuscript of what the club should have been and how it could evolve and, and can i get out of all this other stuff that it's involved in and i swear to you i'm reading your book and i, I go holy shit because i actually watched the the uh, sons of anarchy at the same time i'm going this is my john teller manuscript it literally was like someone speaking to me from the grave that this is the direction we started to go down but this is the path we could be on that's more in aligned with our core values and that's why i was so excited to have you on the show today because look this was happening in the last few weeks. And it just had, it was such a profound impact on me. And basically what the book told me as an entrepreneur, that it's okay to do what you want to do. You don't have to grow for growth's sake. And in this age of social media and all this BS that's being thrown at us, that 
go big or go home. You got to do this. You got to do that. Next guy's doing this many units. Next guy's doing this. It, it's all this crap that doesn't mean shit. We're, we're out there seeing all this stuff getting thrown at us about growth and big and, and, and do all this. But that's actually not what was important to me. It was it was the, the, the business and the enjoyment and the profitability was there. I didn't need to go out and stretch ourselves to do these mediocre deals and, and take money from people when we were doing just fine and enjoying the business more. And, and it was more in line with our core values and in my soul, to be honest uh-huh. with you. It might sound like a crazy hippie right now, but this literally <laughs> was, was what was important to us. So I, I just appreciate you writing the book because it literally, it, it was almost like, hey, you're on a good path. It's okay to do what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with it. Cause it's sometimes you're like, am I, am I weak? Is there something wrong with me that I, I don't want to you know, take all this outside capital and grow? It's okay. Do yeah. you, that's my two cents on it. And that's what I wanted to say to you, sir. I don't have a question for you. I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate it. I'll have to go back and look at, I mean, I just saw a couple of episodes of Sons of Anarchy, but I guess I should, uh, Look at it more closely. but It was I'll, just the manuscript relationship part of the story, but yes. I will recommend another show to you. And that's a show on Hulu called Wu-Tang. I think it's called the Wu-Tang. It's about the Wu-Tang gang. Wu-Tang the, Clan. Yeah, Wu-Tang Clan. And it's, uh, you know, it's an amazing story. I mean, it's not, it's a, this is a... Uh, Listen, I'm a 90s kid. I know about the Wu, my friend. All right. I know yeah, about yeah. I, I know about the M E T H O D man. All right. I know this stuff. <laughs> well, well, OK, well, you sh- if you know it, then you should definitely go I'll check and, it out yes, and for watch sure. this because it's really a business story. Yeah. Believe it or not, it, it's about a, a young entrepreneur who's now I forget is he's Oza, I guess. The RZA. The RZA. Yeah. And, but his real name is Bobby something or other. And he goes through and encounters challenges like most entrepreneurs could not even imagine. I mean, you know, he's living in a part of Staten Island where people are killing each other. And he's got to get to take these kids off the street and, and basically convince them, even though they're diehard enemies, that they have to work together <laughs> mm-hmm. because that's how they're going to have this great band. Mm-hmm. And, Rest in peace, ODB. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it's really, it's a great story. I mean, I, I don't think most people, you know, they see the Wu-Tang Clan and they, they, they don't, they think it's probably a story about music. Well, to a little ex- small extent, it is about music, but mainly it's a business story. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a great business story. So in any event, that's my tip for today. So Jake doesn't like to ask questions. I guess I'll ask the questions here. I know Jake is talking about, he wants his autonomy. What I heard from what Jake was talking about, he wants to retain his autonomy. And I think a lot of small giants want to have that. They want to to be able to the decision-making. And it's the same thing with our education company. I'm not worried about the revenue that we're driving from our mentorship program. I, I want to be able to bring in qualified students. I want to be able to create that culture and those core values within the community and grow an amazing community and create impact at a level that I can sustain. I never want to outgrow my infrastructure. And I think that's what small giants yes. have to be aware of, not outgrowing your infrastructure and just growing for the sake of growing. Remember, revenue is vanity. So I will have a question for you. The question is, what do you think is a unique selling proposition of a small giant that they compete with the bigger competition? How can they go up against the bigger competition and beat them out? What is their, I guess, their, um, you know, that one unique proposition that they have? Well, one of them is certainly... If you're talking about how can they beat the competition in terms of finding customers, Mm -hmm. they can only do that by having products and services that are superior, Mm -hmm. that customers try what they're offering and think that this is better than what I can get any place else. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about how do they compete in terms of talent and attracting talent, you know, it's they're better places to work. It's always better to work in an environment where the people you're working with care about you, mm-hmm. um, and you know that they care about you. So you're talking about how do you compete on different levels, and you know, competing for customers and competing for for employees are two different kinds of competition. And, you know, you succeed in one based on the quality of what you're offering. Mm -hmm. And you succeed on the other by the kind of culture and workplace that you've created. Now, I realize 
uh, I didn't really take in. I thought you guys just did podcasts. Uh, I, I didn't take in that you actually have this whole other business. It sounds like from this what is Jake- for fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do this for fun, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. So no. We're, we're we're no we're we're actual uh, entrepreneurs. We've done quite a bit of of multifamily units and uh, expanded into development. So that's a uh, it's it's an honor that uh, we we're able to take ourselves seriously on this as uh, as well as uh, being entrepreneurs. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. That's that's great. Well, that gives me a whole different perspective on things. He thought we we were just two jabronis, and now we're two jabronis with a business. Do you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, we're not polished. We have those quotes and all, but actually we've been in the trenches. I own the restaurant for over 20 years and I've transitioned out of that and went into multifamily full time. And that's why the book resonated with me because I was always in that family business. I was working with mom and with dad and with my brother. Then when I left the restaurant, I had that identity. Whereas what am I going to do? I love making money, but the real estate was Jake was property managing himself full time. I wasn't able to add to the business. So I said, let's start an education company. I can always learn to be a better investor. Since then, we've written six books. We have four podcasts. We wow. have students that have, that have closed over 35,000 units that they've closed over $2 billion in assets to grow that. But every week it's a grind. And every week I, I'm honored to have, you know, people on the show that we're learning every week because we're never experts. And I think the small giant has to understand that they are never an expert. They're always in learning mode and they're always in gratitude mode because, you know, once you think, you know, the market is always changing. Yes. Once you understand the market, that's, that leads me to this next question. What leads to a small giant's demise? You you mentioned the company that went out of business. What do you see as weaknesses for small giants? And and after I wrote the first book, Mm -hmm. after I, I wrote the original small giants, some of the companies that I had written about at the time, I, I had interviewed all of them. I'd visited all of them. I, I, they were doing great. Mm-hmm. And I thought they were all terrific companies and that they were, they'd already been through a lot of challenges. And uh, I didn't see any reason why anything would go wrong. Well, I, that balloon got popped uh, about two weeks after the book came out. <laughs> Uh, when I wrote to one of the people who was, it was a company in St. Paul, Minnesota, actually outside St. Paul that made, you you know, on a laptop, the hinges, it was that company. And I called one of the CEOs who I had written about in the book. And because I wanted to tell him that the book was coming out and I got a message back that was clearly from, not from the company, but from a personal email. And, well, wait a minute, this guy was the CEO or one of the CEOs. They had two CEOs. I I said, what's happened? And so I did a little investigating and I realized that they were in real trouble, that the company had, you know, was struggling and was actually losing money and that it was in danger, serious danger of going out of business. And when I you know, I, I waited because I, I said, look, I've got to write about this. I mean, I, I sort of, you know, I'll, I'll write about it in Inc. magazine, but, but I owe it to my readers to explain what's happening here. So, but I couldn't write about it then because there were lawsuits all over the place and people couldn't talk to me. So I waited until all those got out of the way and they were all resolved. Then I went and uh, to, to write an article about why had this happened? What, what had exactly had gone on? And I realized that there were a number of different things. The immediate problem was that the founders had gotten old and had retired. Mm-hmm. And they left the board in the hands of outsiders. And when the company began to struggle, the outsiders basically fired the CEOs and, and turned the company over to somebody who was universally disliked by the employees. But that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was why they got into trouble in the first place. And that was that they had, the irony was that they got into trouble because they, because they were trying to do the right thing. They didn't want to lay people off. They had, they had initially been competing with other companies in the United States but when, when laptop manufacturing went to Asia, they suddenly were competing with companies that had much lower costs than they had, especially 
much lower labor costs. There was a volume and price war at that point, and they got in over their head. Yeah. Well, they they had a, they had a choice, that, yeah. and that was: Are we in fact uh, going to compete with these guys on price, or are we going to go and do something else uh, because we can't? And they decided that they were afraid that if they didn't, you know, they, they were dependent on the cash flow of that they were getting from the laptop hinges. And so they decided, well, we can't give up that cash flow. So we're going to compete on price. Well, it got to the point where when I went to visit them, they were selling more laptop hinges than they ever had. And they were losing money on every single one of them. You can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you can't. We, we experienced something very similar recently. The market shifted dramatically for acquiring multifamily assets. And so what happened is a lot of these big players got into the business and they pushed the price up of large multifamily communities because we, oh. we were used to buying 100, 200 unit complexes. And so these big guys came in and drove the prices through the roof. So we had a similar decision to make. And that's why I related the hinge company that we could just start competing and try to compete on price and buy these huge complexes still. But we downshifted to a smaller acquisition. We went literally went from buying bigger to buying 50 to 75, maybe 100 unit complexes instead of the bigger stuff because mm -hmm. the prices were more competitive and we weren't overpaying to compete with these big guys anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, there's just so many points in the book that resonated with me on different levels. And I was like, that's why, you know, when you brought up the Hinge Company, yeah. I was like, don't do it. And I, I'm lit I literally was driving back from Gino's house and listening to it on, on uh, Audible. And, and they're like, okay, we can basically sell out and go compete with the big companies in Asia. And I'm literally like, I hope they don't do it. Don't do it, man. And then, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it, ultimately, they were very fortunate in that they did bring in, they got rid of the CEO that nobody liked. Yeah. Um, and they, they brought in somebody who had actually been hired by that guy. Um, and he was very smart. And he looked at the situation and he said, the irony here is that we are being driven into the ground by our best product. And the on only way we're going to survive is that we have to get out of making this product and we've got to make other products. And But we have to do that. The tricky part of doing that is that we have to maintain our cash flow. As Gino said to start out, cash is king. We have to maintain our cash flow while we're, in fact, developing other products that where we can produce uh, profitably. Mm -hmm. And so it took, it, it's not something you could do over time. They couldn't just tell everybody, look, we're going to raise our prices. You're not going to buy them anymore. Couldn't, they weren't in a situation where they could do that. So but they had to be honest with their with their customers in terms of being able to say, we're making this change and we have this contract with you right now and we're going to live up to that contract. But be aware that we're not going to renew on these terms anymore. And so, but don't worry, in the meantime, we'll do what we said we would do. And they succeeded in doing that. And I don't, I don't even know if they make laptop hinges anymore. They make other products and they're considered one of the best at what they do, which is uh, has to do with the hinges that they make. But these are hinges for other things. And when you think about it, they're hinges for, you know, car seats. They, they needed to be a custom hinge manufacturer. And that was the realization that I got from you very early. And then not yeah. to compete on volume and, and this overseas stuff. And that's and I think that's where they kind of pivoted to. Yeah, and yeah. That's, their, that's that's their USP. Their USP is that's what yeah. they are. They're, they're a, a niche producer and not to produce just on price and, and compete yeah. with that. You're not going to, you're not going to compete in the U S on, on price on those kind of mm -hmm. things. So, um, yeah. But the, again, the irony is the reason they got into this problem in the first place, the reason it became a problem was that they really, they were going to have to, if they didn't compete on price, they were going to have to lay off a lot of people. And they were committed that they were not going to lay anybody off. It also sounded like they lost their way, though, with uh, the leaders in the organization. So they started to lose that's their true. soul potentially, too. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. Well, before we go to the short answers questions, last question for the long answer. What companies would you currently fit into the small giants category today? If you're looking at the landscape of, of business today, do you see any companies that stand out that fit? Yeah, there's going to be a volume, too. Can we get into that? <laughs> <laughs> well... 
I mean, there are a lot of them. I mean, I look Probably at more than them. ever, right? Yeah, well, I look at all the members of this small giants community, mm-hmm. and there are, you know, hundreds, if not more, thousands. Mm-hmm. And I'm also involved in another organization. It's called the Tugboat Institute. And it's actually, this might be something for you guys to look at for your own company. Uh, you can go online and to, to the website of Tugboat Institute. And the difference between Tugboat Institute and Small Giants is that some of the companies in the Tugboat Institute are pretty big companies. I mean, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, for example, you know, uh, and I mean, most of them are smaller, but they're still like in the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in annual revenue. Mm -hmm. And, but the principles that they operate under. Yes. It's okay to get big. Don't lose your way though. That's, that's where I'm at mentally right now. Myself. Well, yes, they have what they call the seven P's, which are defined what they call their companies evergreen company. These are companies that are basically built to last forever mm-hmm. and enduring. Yeah. And there are the companies that they uh, that are members of the Tugboat Institute have what they call the seven P's and the seven P's are number one purpose. They all have a, a larger purpose as to why they're in business. Second is that they persevere. And even if that means doing things like you did, which was, you know, turning down opportunities to get money in other ways. Mm-hmm. Number three, they're private. They're also, they're profitable, but they look at profit as the way I was describing it before as a measure. And they also have a particular way that they go about innovation, which they refer to as pragmatic innovation. And I, I'm not going to go into that right now, but it's, it's an interesting concept and it's, they're right. And another one is that they do not grow fast. The whole idea is that they do pace growth. That's how these companies, you know, for venture capital backed companies, they need to have their companies grow very fast because they need to get the money out of them so that they can pay off their own investors. Mm-hmm. But these companies that are in the Tugboat Institute forces bad decisions at times. It can. It does. It just can. And if you grow, you know, you may only grow 5% or 10% a year, but if you do that for 30 years, you're going to get pretty big and you're going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so I'm actually writing a book about the guy who founded that, which is awesome. uh, very, very interesting. Jake, before we go to the short answers, I just want to plug smallgiants.org. Everyone go to smallgiants.org. And one last thing, you were describing to me what Chick-fil-A's growth was. There you were a small giant. They used to be regional. They used to do billboards. And it's taken them 30, 40, 50 years to become expand. And they're not the small giant anymore. They're the large, they're large giant, giant now. Yeah. That we want to emulate, <laughs> but they still yeah. have small giant ideals. They still worry about the customer. They still have that operator mode where they really want their operators to make a ton of money. They give back to communities. People want to work there. It's just customer service driven. So I don't think they've lost their ideals. And I think, I think they've, they've done an amazing job over the last 30, 40 years to manage that growth and not to lose their core values of the company. Well, they're so. tugboat company. Uh huh. Yes. Tugboat. Okay. Oh, they are. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. No. Uh, they, they would belong in tugboat. Got it. I, I thought they I, belonged. I was just, yeah. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you know, and there are other ones like in and out Burger. So yeah, there, there are lots of these companies around and, and, you know, you mentioned Chick-fil-A. I mean, there are, when I look at all the companies in, in the tugboat Institute, there are also companies that could be in small giants, except a lot of them aren't very small anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but even the small ones have the ambition uh, to grow to a substantial size without losing the qualities that they had when they were smaller. Mm-hmm. And that's not the easiest thing to do. And yes. I think the reason why these companies like to come together is that they can learn from each other. How do you do this? How do you manage to stay private and, and not Accept any outside financing, not accept venture. God, I love being private, you know. I really yeah. do. Yeah. Like, ugh, it's awesome, man. And you know, that's if you can figure out how to like one of one of the do you know what spike ball is? Volleyball? I don't no. know what it is. Oh, <laughs> uh, spike ball is a game. It's a very, very popular game. I'm just not cool and hip, I guess, man. I gotta catch up. I don't get an in and out burger or a spike ball, but I'll catch up. I'll do some research. But you do have Chick-fil-A okay. though, so 
Yeah, yeah. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single-family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team. And I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we are back. Here's the real question, because if I'm a young guy listening to this and you're trying to sell me on the idea of a small giant, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm calling bullshit. I'm saying, no, I want to grow. I want to make the money. What are you talking to me about this crap for? So I don't know a better way to explain to someone, if I was talking to myself at 25, I don't think I could sell myself on the idea that this is good. Okay. You know, at 25, you're like, no, I want to blow up. I want to grow. I want to make money, all this kind of stuff. So I'm fearful that someone listening to this, a younger Jake, if you will, is hearing it. It's going in one ear and out the other. Can you help that person, that persona as to why becoming a small giant may be in their best interest or why it may be good? Why a small giant? Because I I don't know that I, I can do it justice. I just know it intuitively and I lived it. So it, I understand it, but I don't know that I'm doing a well enough job explaining it other than I know it in my heart because I've, I've lived through it. Well, number one, we talk about being a small giant. We're talking about companies that want to be the absolute best at what they are. Mm-hmm. They want to be second to no one in the world. Number two, they want to be the best place to work. They want to be the place where everybody wants to work because it's just such a great company. Number three, you know, they want a company that is admired by outsiders because of what it does and what it contributes to make the world a better place and what it contributes to its community. So if that's the kind of company that you want, if if that's your definition of great, now you may have another definition of great. Your, Your definition of great may be that you want to have a big company. Okay, that's fine. But then you have to look also at at an organization like Tugboat, which is, it is possible to do that. I mean, you can grow and you can make tons of money if you're patient. Do you want to do it in like two or three years? Well, then you are going to need uh, yep. venture capital or, or something like that. The get their itis. We call that get their itis. Right, right. And But if you're willing to wait, you know, 10, 20 years and and just keep growing. And if you're actually building a company for the long term, the question I would ask the 25 year old, is this something you just want to do for a couple of years? I mean, is that, is this something that you want to do? I don't even think they're thinking like that. We, we always refer to as having a hundred year mindset. Yeah, you know, thinking for the long term. And and that's what we try to get across to people because so many and it's not I'm, I don't mean to be hating on the guys that are in their 20s. I just know that my mindset is in a much different place now than it was then. And I'm trying to just share with folks some of I don't want to call them mistakes, but, you know, places where uh, I, I personally made mistakes where I think I could have been better if I was thinking more long term. And, and it's it's short termism and and the get there right. I think that ultimately prevents people from, you know, living a, a really fulfilled life and, and a great business life because they take shortcuts. Whereas if you think long-term and you don't need the immediate gratification, you're going to be in an amazing place. Now, I'm just going to, the richest real estate developer in the world, whoever that guy may be, right? Uh-huh. He may have a private jet. I don't have a private jet right now, but everything else, if I want to do something, the, the money's there to do it. So guys, like if you're thinking about it, like you may not have 
you know, the, the money in your first 10 years to go buy yourself a private jet. But if you hang in there, if that's the goal, because that's, you know, so many people look at stupid shit like that and that's where they want to get, you can still live a great rewarding life financially without selling your soul from the jump to get there. So I, I think that's where I'm cautioning you folks. Yeah, you're you're going to be able to enjoy yourself financially. This is like the difference between a smart person and a wise person. A smart person learns from his mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Mm. And it's ultimately the wise people who are going to do the best. Now, another way of looking at that, Jake, is that your perspective is different now than it was when you were 25. But that's because you've, you've taken all the hard knocks along the way. Got hit in the gut a few times, multiple yeah. times repeatedly, actually. But yes, right. And you know that's one way to learn. That's yeah. Th there's nothing wrong with learning. That's that how way. we learned. That's that, exactly how we learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but again, if you if you want to be wise instead of smart, then you talk to people who've already been through that, and who say, no, 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 you don't want to go through that. It's really that's painful. You can shorten the learning curve. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about the cons of a small giant? So you know, we kind of talked about the, the values and, and the long-termism. What, what did you find out uh, that, that was usually like, well, well, this is some area where the, the small giants are not succeeding? Well, you know, that's the new chapter in the 10th anniversary edition, which is basically how small giants fail mm -hmm. and came up with three critical ones. Number one is you have to learn how to survive on your gross margins and then protect those gross margins. Now, that involves understanding what a gross margin is. A gross margin is basically difference between what you're selling something for and what, what it costs you to, to create it. Mm -hmm. And one of the easy ways to compete in the marketplace is to drop your prices b below everybody else. And lo and behold, it works. You'll get more customers. But if you allow that to happen, you could wind up in a situation. You very likely will wind up in a situation after a while when you're not making money anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, go back to what Gino said to begin with. You know, sales are nice. Profits are nicer. But you live or die on cash flow. Mm hmm I mean, basically, you go out of business when you don't have enough cash to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, that's what failure is. Mm -hmm. And the second one that I came up with was that you have to be flexible in your niche. In other words, you may have a, a niche that you're competing in, but niches change over time. And they change because the environment changes. And if you're not aware of those changes, you're going to get in trouble. And, and if you don't adapt to those changes, that's what got Rhythm and Hughes in trouble, was that they had grown up and developed the company in an atmosphere where basically movie making was totally centered in Hollywood. Well, that was fine, but then movie making started to spread all over the world and they didn't adapt their business model mm -hmm. um, to reflect that. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately wh why they wound up in chapter 11. And then the third one that I came up with was that you have to be, it really goes back to cash flow again, which is that you have a healthy balance sheet, <laughs> meaning that you have to have Leverage Enough. for the real estate investors out there. You have to have yeah. proper leverage on, on your assets. Yes. You have to be able to, you know, it comes back to you have to have enough cash so that you could, you have to have enough cash on your balance sheet. Your assets have to exceed your liabilities mm -hmm. by enough. That there's something left over for you. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's very easy there was one company that I wrote about, which you guys read about, called uh, Nick's Pizza, and Nick. Are they got still it. they're still around, right? They they pulled they pulled are. out of their their funk and they they turned it around, right? Well, yes, he he wound up basically selling the company. Oh, okay. Because uh, he he was 
he kept getting into trouble by making mistakes, doing things that he thought he wanted. He was over levered. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it was that he was determined to open in Chicago because his business was really in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. And every time he went to open in Chicago, he got screwed. I mean, uh, you know, the things changed and he was, what he was doing was he was taking on a lot of debt and he got to a point where he had so much debt. And he, when, when you have debt, it doesn't just sit there. You've got to keep paying mm-hmm. for it. You got to keep paying the interest and paying, paying down that debt. Just like if you have a mortgage on your house, you have to pay the person who gives you the mortgage and or they can come in and seize your seize your property. Well, you don't want that to happen, presumably. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want that to happen, then you better have a healthy balance sheet. Now, that means the thing about people who are starting out in business is that very, very, very few exceptions. They have no idea how to understand the numbers of a business. Mm-hmm. They they really don't know how to. It's one of the first things they encountered. They they get to a certain point. A company, you know, when a company is really really small, then then you can sort of wing it. But as soon as the company grows at all, and it and if it's successful, it will grow. You have to. There's a reason why there are things like financial statements. There's a reason why there's an income statement and a balance sheet and a cash flow statement. And there's a reason why they're different. And you have to educate yourself about that on at least some fundamental basis, or you're going to get into serious trouble. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't know what's, once a company gets above a certain size, you don't know what's going on in that company, and you can't figure out what's going on in that company unless you're able to read the numbers. Mm-hmm. And uh, Oh, I have a tip for everybody on that that may help the, the, the listeners. Sure. And so if you're starting out, and we have many real estate investors listening, basic draw report, okay? There, you have accrual accounting, you have cash accounting. Uh-huh. Early on, focus on the cash. They're both important. Do a draw report every month if you're not already doing that. Your top line cash, expenses, okay, any money that moved into your CapEx or your reserve account, okay, uh-huh. then net that out and have a baseline. Say, you know, something plus mortgage. If your annual mortgage is 10000 mortgage plus X, that'll get you a baseline. Keep that amount in the account every month. Do not go below that. Everything above that could be, quote, unquote, a draw after you put money on the side for rainy day, reserves, CapEx, okay? Uh-huh. Do that every month and calculate if you're in apartments, profit per unit, we call it PPU internally. So you know exactly how much apartment is making every month. That is that is the bare minimum of, of what you should be doing to understand your business. And we speak to people that have five, 600 apartments out there. And they're not, this gang, this is the, the very basics you need to be doing. You need to understand the cash to Bo's point. And I think, yeah. Jake, the other important thing, though, is, you know, when you're investing in, in real estate, you're becoming an entrepreneur. Jake and Gino, we say yeah. we create multifamily entrepreneurs. You're collecting these assets, but every single yeah. asset should be run as its own entity. It should yeah. have its own balance sheet, its own income statement. It yeah. should have its own draw report. You should be having n- numbers based on that property. And that's how you scale. So you buy your next property. That's a separate entity in and of itself. And you have proper accounting records for each of these. And if you can't do that, and if you don't know how to do that, partner up with somebody who knows that because Jake is the worst bookkeeper in the world. I'm probably the second worst bookkeeper in the world. Hey, we, we get it done some, though, man. <laughs> we found somebody to help us out with that, but statement of cash flows, income statement. Yep. And that's what really investing in real estate is all about is becoming an entrepreneur and understanding those numbers. And once you understand those numbers, you can continue to grow. Don't have a grasp on those numbers, hit the brakes, learn how to implement some systems and learn about those numbers before you buy your next deal. Well, what, what you outlined, Jake, is really sort of a, a, a shorthand in the real estate business. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, which every business has that. They're different for different yep. businesses. I mean, ultimately, you can, you can measure every business with an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. But what you described is, in fact, something that is particularly adapted to the real estate business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is something that you learn from other people in that business. Mm-hmm. And if you go into it 
you know, suppose you go into <laughs> you go into something or beer, you know, okay. there are going to be similar things to what Jake described for uh, real estate. Mm-hmm. There are going to be similar things. I don't know what they are. I can't describe them to you, but I'm I'm sure Fritz Maytag can. And you can use to sort of make sure that you keep on top of the numbers. I mean, mm-hmm. y- you know, I'm I, I've I've worked for a long time with a a company called Springfield Remanufacturing SRC, which is famous for what it calls the great game of business, which is basically a system of running a company where everybody in the company, I mean, I'm talking about, this is a manufacturing company and I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, you know, the welders in the plant and everybody else, they understand exactly what's going on in that company. They understand awesome. how you, well, like I, I say, they basically say, look, business is a game. You know, it's not an art, it's not a science, it's a game. And like any game, you can't play it unless you get it. Mm -hmm. And in order to get it, three conditions have to exist. Number one, you have to know what the rules are. Number two, you've got to get enough information so that you can follow the action and keep score. And number three, you have to care about whether or not you win or lose. You have to have a stake in the outcome. And if those conditions, if you set up a business so that those conditions exist, right, then anybody anybody can understand it. That's what they did at Springfield Remanufacturing, and they developed a system that has since been imitated by thousands of companies, which basically creates a business where everybody in that business knows what's going on. They, they you know, they, they've got. I don't know. I don't know how many employees you guys have got, but uh, they've a little over 50. Yeah. yeah, Well, they've got like, I think they're up to 1500 or 2000. And, but they're set up in a way so that everybody can, you know, follow that. And then they have something, they have a bonus program that's connected to that originally had the name Stop Gooder, which st- stood for Skip the Praise, Give Us the Raise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like to uh, write that down. And the, the way it worked was that um, they would do an annual plan and they would say, you know, if we can exceed this annual plan, we're going to share that with everybody in the company. Now, uh, we're going to we're, we're going to keep half of that in the company because we need it to buy new things, buy better equipment and so forth. But uh, the rest of it, we're going to give to you. And the way it's going to work is that in the first quarter, you're going to be competing for 10 percent of the bonus pool in the second. Qu- well, if you get it then the second quarter, you're going to comp- compete for 20% of the bonus pool. In the third quarter, you're going to compete for, you're going to uh, try and get 30%. And the fourth quarter, you're going for 40%. Now, if you don't make it one quarter, it, it goes over to the next quarter. So if you don't make the first quarter, then in the second quarter, you're you're going for 10 plus 20 or 30 percent. rolls yeah mm-hmm. yeah so you you can either win quarter by quarter which is probably the best way to do it or you can win on a hail mary pass <laughs> in the fourth quarter um which is much harder but hey, it happens. you never know Absolutely. Yeah, you never know i gotta say so, the hail marys jake yeah so in any event everybody understand uh, once once you sort of lay out the game that way people understand oh okay so we're, we're, we're going to go, this is what we're going for in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we hit it, we're going to get a bonus. Uh, if, uh, if we don't make it, then it's going to kick over to the second quarter. Mm-hmm. And people are able to keep score. They're able to sort of see what they're doing and how they're doing uh, with regard to the plan. So I like it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it really is. In the time that I've been looking at businesses, which is, you know, 40, 40 years now, it's the most powerful management tool that I have ever seen. It, it has the greatest ability 
to transform a company is at least a company with you know a substantial number of employees well they're working towards something and they're working towards it you know as a group so yeah. it's uh it's definitely very impactful I've, i have one more question for you and so obviously a ton of research went into the book yeah and i just want to know what was your most surprising takeaway from the research? Now, it doesn't even have to be something necessarily that landed in the book. I just wanted to know what really stood out to you. Well, what stood out to me were the the commonalities between these companies, which, I mean, when I initially sh- chose them, I was looking for companies that were, as I said, really the best in there at what they were doing. I mean, in other words, that if you were to ask somebody, even a competitor, to name what what are the best companies in this business, they would they would name that company. You know, a competitor might not name it as number one, but they would say, you know, they recognize this is this is a great company, and um, that's what I was initially looking for with all these companies. What surprised me was that when I got into the nitty gritty of it and and really looked at what these companies were doing in order to achieve this status of, of being regarded as one of the best companies in their niche or in their industry was how much they had in common, how similar they were in the way that they looked at the different aspects of what they did. The tugboat mentality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Gino's going to wrap it up here, but before we do, um, best place to get the book and find out more about you. Well, I have a website that's very easy to remember, boburlingham.com. And if you go there, you can, you can get access to all the books that I've written. Uh, there is a website that I have just for small giants, but which is called smallgiantsbook.com. I would say that, you know, and and then of course there's smallgiants.org, which is offers all kinds of services to small giants companies that go well beyond what was in the book. I mean, as I said, I was just listening in on an interview that they were doing, Paul Spiegelman was doing with uh a, a really fantastic guy who was talking about the future of work and how work is changing. And it was extremely interesting, but that really, that really goes beyond the book, small giants, mm-hmm. but it's v- very much a topic that is of interest to companies that view themselves as small giants. I would say that tugboatinstitute.com is uh, another one that you, you could go to, and there's a lot of value there. And if you want to reach me, I'm the easiest person in the world to reach. All right, I'm putting right. your phone number in right now. <laughs> I'm you, kidding. You write to Bo at BoBurlingham.com. Love that. Jake, do you want me to wrap it up, Jake? Wrap it up. So this is not <laughs> going to be a, a wrap up of Bo's life, but really a wrap up of his book. And, and for the listeners out there, if you're out there, you're struggling You really haven't set your goals. You haven't set your vision. You haven't set your core values. You don't have a mission statement. Start off with that. Start off with the end in mind. Where do you see yourself? Where do you see your company? Where do you see your future in the next 30, 40, hopefully 50 or 60 years? And start reverse engineering from that. The next thing is to start taking a long-term mindset. Don't worry about what's going to happen with this quarter or this year or next year. Really think about the future. The next thing is to read the book, Small Giants. I'm holding up for all you YouTubers out there. It's going to give you some great insights on what a a great small company looks like. Do you want to emulate a small company? Do you want to be the next Chick-fil-A out there? Well, how do you do that? You start out by reading Small Giants, go to Tugboat Institute, and ultimately, Jake, I'll leave you with this. Big does not equal great, and great does not equal big, my friend. Love it. Bo, it was a pleasure and an honor to have you on today. Thank you so much. Well, the pleasure was all mine, and good luck, guys. I uh, I look forward to being in touch in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Bo. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.